The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, before we get started, I want to make sure that people can hear me speaking. So if uh, anyone wants to raise a hand, that's helpful, then I know you can hear me. Awesome. Okay. <clears throat> Welcome and thank you for attending the joint stakeholder meeting for the Colorado Medical Board, <clears throat> Colorado Dental Board, State Board of Veterinary Medicine, Colorado Podiatry Board, State Board of Optometry, and State Board of Nursing via webinar today. The time is 1.01 p.m. And before we get started, we would like to introduce um, staff members from the Division of Professions and Occupations that are present. My name is Darcy Magnuson and I'm a regulatory analyst with the division. Also attending today is Dimitri Kunin, Senior Program Director, and Elena Kemp, Regulatory Coordinator. We will be facilitating this stakeholder meeting. Due to concerns regarding COVID-19, the division has transitioned to a platform that is 100% virtual, and we appreciate your flexibility. As many of you have been to DORA stakeholder meetings before, we would like to reiterate the importance of your comments today. DORA makes decisions every day that may affect your life and your business, and your input is vital in the rulemaking process. Throughout this process, our goal is to create regulations that clarify and explain legislation, ensure minimum competency to enter and continue to practice, and provide only what is absolutely necessary for consumer protection without creating unnecessary, or unnecessary barriers to the marketplace. Your input will be part of the information that goes to each board as the boards consider adopting revisions to their rules to implement Colorado House Bill 21-1276 concerning the prevention of substance use disorders. This meeting is being recorded and will be posted on each board's webpage by the close of business on Monday. As this stakeholder meeting is held solely by webinar, please raise your hand by using the hand icon if you would like to speak, and we will unmute your line so you will be heard by everyone, or you can type your comment in the question section and we will read it out loud. Before we start taking comments, I wanna ask that anyone providing comments, please state your name and who you represent. Feel free to provide either general comments on the rule changes or specific comments on the proposed language. Um, and because we have so many people participating today, please try to limit your comments to no more than three to five minutes and try not to repeat something that was already said. If you wanna state whether you're in agreement with something that someone else said, then that works just fine and we can note that. If you're using audio through your computer, Please remember to put any phones on vibrate or turn them off. And whether you are using computer or phone audio, try to keep background noises to a minimum when speaking. At this point in time, um, Senior Program Director Dimitri Kunin is going to give a little bit more information about this legislative implementation. So I will turn it over to Dimitri. Thank you, Darcy. Thank you, staff. Um, and thank you to everybody who's come to participate in this stakeholder meeting um, that's spanning across all boards, including the Board of Pharmacy. So House Bill 21-1276 did a lot in the legislature, but one specific piece that has brought us all together today is in this specific section six that is up on the screen. And for those individuals that may be dialed in or can't see it, I will read the section um, in law that has brought us um, towards the rulemaking process that spans all provider boards or all more specifically prescriber boards um, as it impacts the ability or specifically the day supply and quantity of benzodiazepines that can be prescribed to patients. So the specific piece of statute that's written uh, states the following, on or before November 1st, 2021, the applicable board for each prescriber shall by rule limit the supply of benzodiazepine that a prescriber may prescribe to a patient who has not obtained a benzodiazepine prescription from a prescriber within the last 12 months, except that the rule must not limit the supply of benzodiazepine prescribed to treat epilepsy, a seizure or seizure disorder, a suspected seizure disorder, spasticity, alcohol withdrawal, or neurological condition, including a I believe traumatic, post-traumatic brain injury or catatonia. The rules must allow for appropriate tapering off of benzodiazepines and must not require or encourage abrupt discontinuation or withdrawal of benzodiazepines. 
So one thing I just want to re-emphasize in this specific section, um, Elena, if you can scroll up for just a moment, um, in the first sentence or two, it talks about, it, it repeats a few words, but just from a, con, you know, to mitigate any confusion, specifically talking about patients that are benzodiazepine naive uh, for 12 months, uh, that this limitation would apply to. Obviously with certain exclusions as mentioned, as well as a protective kind of clause regarding tapering off um, to mitigate any withdrawal the patients may otherwise have. So the goal is to do rulemaking across the six prescriber boards that have the ability to prescribe benzodiazepines, which are controlled substances. Therefore, any prescriber uh, that is prescribing a benzodiazepine has a DEA re registration. Um, looking across a few other states and looking across some best practices, the following uh, rule has been drafted and it would be implanted respective to each practice act's um, specific location within their own rules. Out of consistency and to mitigate confusion um, across prescriber boards as patients are taken care of often as a joint um, effort by healthcare providers, the hope and intention is even though each board is policy autonomous and can pass their own rules, we hope that there's agreement across boards and that the rule is identical at best, but with minimal changes at least. Um, recently, this was uh, presented in this format to the dental board and to the board of nursing um, to solicit any feedback that they may have, and they did not provide any. Um, it only went to those boards prior to this meeting and not others, just based on a timing um, perspective of scheduled meetings. So your feedback today based on this proposed um, rule will make it back to their respective boards as Darcy has talked about and go towards a finish line uh, for a permanent rulemaking hearing across all six boards at their respective times. So the proposed rule is as follows. A limit of a supply of benzodiazepine prescribed shall not exceed 30 days for that a prescriber may prescribe to a patient who has not obtained a benzodiazepine prescription from a prescriber within the, with, within the last 12 months. This rule shall not, shall not limit the supply of benzodiazepine to patients that are prescribed a benzodiazepine to treat any of the following, and it lists them out one through five, epilepsy, a seizure, seizure to disorder, spasticity, number four is alcohol withdrawal, number five is a neurological condition, including post-traumatic brain injury or catatonia. The last clause or paragraph in the proposed rule is, nothing in this rule shall be construed to require a practitioner to abruptly discontinue, limit, or forcibly taper a patient on benzodiazepine. The standard of care requires effective and individualized treatment for each patient as deemed appropriate by the prescribing practitioner without an administrative or codified limit on dose or quantity that is more restrictive than the approved by the Food and Drug Administration in parens FDA. So it, often our rules are not intended to mimic or replicate what's already stated in statute. However, statute put a requirement across boards to put in rule a limitation on the quantity or day supply. So essentially the variable here is that 30. Um, and we're again open to feedback in that regard. The repetition of statute is put into here only because if this is mentioned in rule, we wouldn't want somebody reading the rule to miss that other information of exclusion and also the risk mitigation clause at the end um, so that it's in one place. So with that, hopefully that provided a summary for or a foundation for stakeholders to provide some feedback and, um, and we'll collect it at the beginning now. So at this point, um, feel free to raise your hand in the webinar to provide any feedback you may have um, and staff will go through and call upon your name. Thanks, Dimitri, and this is Darcy again. I also wanted to point out that we do have two program directors attending the meeting as well today. So we have Karen Phelan, who is the program director of the Board of Optometry, Colorado Podiatry Board, and State Board of Veterinary Medicine, among other boards who are not impacted by this. And then we have Yukon Morford, who is the program director of the Colorado Dental Board, also other boards, but those aren't impacted by this legislation. We have a written comment from
from Cheryl Peterson. I have experience as a nurse with a substance disorder that has been through peer and stayed on authorized benzos, which was the wrong thing to do. Um, my name is Cheryl Peterson, provided her email. And if you're having some technical issues, we can try to work through those with you if you would like to um, speak other than just written comments. So we will monitor to see um, if you have your hand raised. Otherwise, if you do want to submit written comments via email, you can always do that via the email address that's provided on the notice for today's meeting, and we can drop that in the, the chat as well. Um, Amy Goodman, I see you have your hand raised. You are self-muted. Looks like you're clear, Amy Goodman. Hi there, thank you. My name is Amy Goodman and I am with the Colorado Medical Society. Um, thank you for the opportunity to weigh in today. First, I just wanted to give a general comment about how we are still concerned about the implementation of this and how it will impact patients, particularly patients who are in a vulnerable position already because they are being prescribed a benzodiazepine for the first time within the past 12 months. So many, if not most of those patients are probably in a vulnerable state. And if they are approaching a pharmacist who is then going to question why they are being prescribed a benzodiazepine um, for a supply greater than 30 days, um, we're worried about the impact it could have, particularly because there is a lot of stigma around the conditions that um, they may have. Um, but at this, at this time, the only specific comment um, about the proposed rule and the language in there um, is that um, for number two, a seizure or seizure disorder, I think the language of the law also includes a suspected seizure disorder, and we'd like to see that um, included within number two. So thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to place you back on mute, but if you want to add anything else, feel free to raise your hand again. Um, the next person I see is Kyle Legat. Legat, sorry for mispronouncing your last name. Your last name. Oh, no worries. Clear? Thank you, Kyle Clear? Leggett, family physician. Uh, more of a comment or question actually is how would you interpret this 30-day uh, rule for a condition such as panic disorder or phobia of flying, where someone might prescribe a low-dose benzodiazepine for a year for episodic um, need for, let's say, flights, uh, where you would expect five tablets to last for a year or more. Thank you. Elena, can you type in that? Elena, can you type in that question in the comments so we get that captured? Oh, yes. My apologies. Can, can you repeat that? Sure, I'm happy to. I guess my question or comment is that a 30-day uh, prescription maybe doesn't take into account episodic treatment for things like panic attacks or specific <laughs> phobia, such as uh, flight and how a low dose prescription could last for a much longer time than 30 days. So would two tablets uh, for phobia of flying that last for a year exceed that 30 day limitation? Sorry, I'm trying to figure out how to capture this with also type the question into the chat function if that would be better. That's helpful. Okay. 
And Elena, this Thank is... Thank you for that. Go ahead, Dimitri. This is Dimitri. Um, Elena, I did double check and the stakeholder was absolutely correct. I think for number two, I, I think we can be comfortable in taking the comment out and putting the word suspected in front of the second seizure um, or uh, so it would be a seizure disorder or suspected seizure di disorder. Okay. No, let me double check that again. Yeah, it's a, a seizure or seizure disorder and then comma or a suspected seizure di 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 disorder. And I think that would fulfill Bill's intent. Uh, seizure, um, and then, yep, or suspect, suspected seizure disorder. And then instead of that first comma, just put in the uh, word or, um, and that would be verbatim from the statute, which is fine. Yep, perfect. Similar to that, we did receive a written comment from Allie Daly with uh, Children's Hospital Colorado, who said, uh, we would second the previous comment that suspected seizure, seizure disorder should be included consistent with the bill. Yep, thank you for that. Leanne Blaskowski, um, I show that you have your hand raised. You're self muted, Leanne Blaskowski. Yes. Hello. Um, Hello. I'm a nurse practitioner in Colorado Springs, just to make the wording a little less um, awkward. Maybe if we say a seizure or suspected or seizure or confirmed slash suspected seizure disorder so that we're not having seizure written three times in the same line. Just to make it Thank a little less that. awkward. I think the rationale is to be consistent with the way it's written in statute, um, so as not to be confusing or conflicting with statute. I am going to go ahead and place you back on mute. If you want to say anything else, please raise your hand again. Sarah Gallo, um, I see your hand is raised. You are self-muted. Hi. Like you're good. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, this is Sarah Gallo. I had my um, control panel over that <laughs> comment on the top. Uh, so I don't know if this was already discussed, um, but you know, if I'm giving somebody the, like, is it for 30 days of the medication or 30 day prescription? So if it is episodic, technically, you know, I give them, they, they make it last a little longer you know, uh, or or we're saying as needed, and we give 30, then are we, you know, then we have to think about whether or not this is violating uh, the statement. So um, I didn't know if they could, it would maybe be specific to like, how many days of medication are you giving? Or uh, the amount, I guess. Thank you. Sure. Elena, are you clear on that? No, actually, my apologies. Can you, um, I just want to sum it up so that the, the board members, um, I didn't want to put it in my own language. Can you, can you sum that up for me, Miss, Miss Sarah? Oh, it looks like you're self-muted. Yeah. 
sorry, uh, I'm I'm writing um, in the comp for questions, I guess. Uh, comments. Um, okay. Does that works as well. Yeah, Lena and Darcy, if I could bring up just a hypothetical question for stakeholders to consider, especially the two that have brought up um, kind of these PRN or as needed episodic uh, potential conditions. I think they're important points, um, but I, I want to just ask, would in most circumstances for patients like these, would they already have kind of a defined history of benzodiazepine um, use within at least the last 12 months, it, at least in the majority of time. I, I, I would imagine at the beginning, the first prescription may be limited to what is indicated in this rule, uh, but subsequent prescriptions um, would have that tailoring history of 12 months. So if there's any other comment related to that, feel free to provide. Yeah, I would say if you were a different prescriber, so if you uh, just are establishing with a patient um, and they had an old prescription that lasted them a year and a half and you're rewriting them another prescription, then you technically they technically have been prescribed, but I didn't prescribe it, but they're getting a longer than 30 day supply. Does that make sense? It does, yeah. And if, if there's any suggested language that you would throw out for consideration um, that would carve out that group to somehow be ex an exception. Um, by all means, feel feel free to provide that input too. I'm just I'm not I'm, in my mind. I'm struggling to kind of put together under one word or category all the potential kind of as needed conditions that may exist for benzodiazepines. There's certain ones that come to mind, absolutely, like flight or, or, or others, but and, and even episodic con conditions. But I don't know if they all fall under kind of one common verbiage across all prescriber boards. If that makes sense. Is there another state that has a, a ruling or a policy that is similar to what we're trying to um, propose? There are a few, um, just less than a handful that I could come or, or research. Um, and I, I can't recall them off the top of my head, but I remember some were 30, some were seven. I want to say there was one that was 90, but I'm not 100% certain on that. And, and then also, I wonder, is I can't remember if there is an actual rule on supply of uh, opioids, too, that I wonder if, if there's something written for opioids similarly in other states or even in our policies that we could probably use some of the stuff they've encountered and written um, differently for that reason. Thank you for that. Um, I'm you muted yourself. I'm going to place you back on mute. If you think of anything else, feel free to raise your hand. Um, we've received a couple more written comments. One from Alexis Ritvo. I'm wondering if there will be further discussion around rulemaking, what counts as a 30 day script, and any limit on number of tablets. Um, we received another question from Karen Zink. Will there be any allowance for continued prescribing for PTSD or other neurological conditions which are not in the 12-1276? Yeah, and I'm just looking back just for reference at the actual statute. Um, the statute doesn't define supply. It, it simply states limit the supply of benzodiazepine. Um, so day supply is often more flexible uh, based on the directions provided, which will alter quantity of prescriptions versus defining a specific quantity that may have a variable day supply. Um, so I believe that's why the 
dip 30 days versus a certain quantity amount of pills um, was used. And that doesn't also include the rationale um, that would speak to quantity being different based on the benzodiazepine being prescribed is that may differ depending on which one is chosen. Thank you, Dimitri. Um, I also wanted to add that we have the program director of the Board of Nursing, uh, Roberta Hills is on the webinar as well, and Lori Bratton, who is from the Colorado Medical Board staff. Um, another hand raised from Robert Valick. I am, you're unmuted on our end, currently self-muted. Looks like Hi. you're good. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. Thanks. Uh, yeah, my name is Rob Valak. I'm the director of the Colorado Consortium for Prescription Drug Abuse Prevention. Um, just wanted to uh, toss in a few comments um, here. First, um, we agree with prior comments um, from both our colleagues at CMS and Kyle and the other clinicians that have spoken so far. So um, uh, total agreement with what they've been saying. Uh, and uh, for, for background and context, it might be helpful. I know the legislative intent of this, it didn't get into legislative declaration, but I know the legislative intent was to try to limit, you know, what would be a, a continuous supply of benzodiazepines of greater than, you know, X number of days, which was left out and left to rulemaking for people on the first prescription for an acute condition, much like the motivation was with opioids was people with acute pain, not you know, exempting chronic pain, exempting certain conditions, limiting that first supply for the acute prescription to a certain number of days. And there was no agreement at the time on what would that look like. So it did not get specified in statute. It just said, you know, the, the boards shall do this and limit. Um, so that's, you know, that's kind of where that came from. And Dimitri is correct in saying, well, I think everything he said was correct. So that, Thank you, Dimitri. Um, but yeah, he was definitely correct in saying the motivation for looking at days versus pills uh, or you know, dosage units was for that reason, because of the differences between medications and how a, a, a prescriber might choose to treat with something that might be once a day, twice a day, PRN, you know, those sorts of things. Um, definitely true. And as I listen to those exemptions, I think, the, and I also know that intent was not to try to limit for that occasional use um, for the, the anxiety for flight or you know, pre-procedural pre anxiety or whatever those kinds of situational anxiety types of things might be, that the intent was not to limit that. Um, so I, I'm more com we're comfortable with trying to address that somehow, either with an exemption, uh, further exemption, or another way to do that might be to you know, to differentiate, we're talking about, you know, continuous use versus PRN use, and you could say shall not exceed 30 continuous days that, you know, for that a prescriber may prescribe to a patient, blah, blah, blah. So it's, I think that's the notion behind it was if you take an acute condition and use a benzodiazepine to manage the acute condition for more than 30 continuous days, there's a good amount of medical evidence that that's not a good idea. Um, that things start to happen, efficacy starts to wane, side effects start to increase, tolerability and tapering gets more difficult, all kinds of things have been documented uh, in the literature. But that's just an idea is, I think the intent is this, for an acute condition, benzodiazepine naive patient, in, in that instance, giving them more than 30 days of continuous benzodiazepine on the first prescription, is, is probably not a good idea. And that's also backed up, you know, all the guidelines that I've looked at, I've looked at guidelines nationally from about seven or eight provider organizations like Kaiser and, and some of the provider organizations. Um, and then I've also looked at what New York City did and what the state of Pennsylvania did. And most of them are coming down somewhere between two and four weeks um, as what they you know, recommend is these limits. Same with the state laws, as Dimitri said, you're right. Um, they vary from seven days to 30 days. So we are comfortable at least with, you know, anything that's consistent with that. And I think the 30 days is pretty sensible as far as that goes. The labeling goes out to 28 or 30, depending on the studies um, for which benzodiazepine it is. So it also is 
converging there with labeling. Um, so I think that, that that's pretty reasonably set as far as the number of days. And if it's, um, you know, make that continuous days, that might address that issue or do an exemption on PRN use, you know, um, that can last longer than 30 days, but is, you know, what would be less than a 30 day continuous supply or some somehow to, to address it that way. And those, I think, are my comments. So thanks for the, the opportunity to have input. Thank you. And I do want to add that um, it's always helpful when stakeholders give specific feedback on possible changes um, to the proposed language because this is very, a very rough draft. And so if you want to submit that in writing as well, um, I did drop in the, the chat um, the rulemaking inbox where we receive all rulemaking feedback that then goes to the board. So those specific um, key changes are, are very helpful. Uh, for the board to boards to consider. Rob, thank you very much um, for your comments. I, I want to just pick that off of what Darcy said. That was very helpful. I do want to hear back from the individuals that spoke earlier regarding episodic use and acute use. Does the for, uh, the does adding the verbiage continuous between thirty and days? Um, resolve some of those concerns, if not all. Um, Dr. Leggett, Leggett, sorry, you're self-muted. It looks like you're good. Thank you. Yep, Kyle Leggett, family physician. Um, I agree with Rob Ballack's comments around clarifying uh, continuous use for those 30 days would certainly allow for um, episodic or PRN use um, that I think I agree with him was not the intent of the bill. Thank you. Um, and I am going to actually go to uh, Mr. Kevin Snyder. Your hand has been raised for a little while, so I don't want to think that we're skipping over you, Kevin Snyder. Yeah, hi, uh, this is Dr. Kevin Snyder. Um, I'm the Chief Medical Officer, Chief Whole Recovery. Um, I'm board certified in addiction medicine and psychiatry uh, here in Colorado Springs. Um, are you able to hear me okay? Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, uh, I definitely appreciate the opportunity to be part of this. Um, I'm tracking the most recent uh, comments about acute versus uh, chronic and then episodic versus daily. I think that's extremely important. Um, I'm wondering if uh, the conditions that are listed um, could be expanded upon uh, that, that may help it. Um, and this I'm not 100% sure on how to go forward with this, but um, conditions such as panic disorder are indicated um, for the uh, treatment with benzodiazepines. Um, and so I believe that if that were to be one of the conditions um, listed, um, then that would take care of that question of episodic use. Um, it really should be episodic anyway and written as such. Um, it shouldn't be a daily use, uh, but um, I would be concerned as a psychiatrist to be completely limited or, or have that excluded from um, you know, those conditions that you have listed there. Um, and I scratched my head why alcohol withdrawal would be included there. I can't imagine um, that needing um, continuous treatment with benzodiazepines. It seems to be not necessary, but uh, I, uh, I might be missing something there. Um, but otherwise, I, I would just um, comment to to what's already been said, that uh, if there is a way to differentiate between the episodic and uh, daily use, that's uh, a critical piece, in my opinion. Um, and um, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Snyder. And I apologize for not knowing titles. I can only see names, so please, um, it's not out of disrespect, introduce yourself with the appropriate title. So my apologies on that. Oh, no disrespect taken. Thank you so much.
Okay, we have a written comment um, from Amy Goodman um, who that says, maybe the issue of episodic conditions could be addressed by saying something like 30 continuous days or 30 doses for a PRN prescription. So um, I just want to jump in and add, this is Dimitri, um, that I believe we just want to be careful that we wouldn't be more restrictive in the list of exceptions that's provided in the original statute, which is the five categories um, provided here on screen and rule. So we wouldn't be able to, I believe, add further conditions. However, it sounds like from the comments that have come in, that continuous would solve, I think to a large degree, if not the entirety, um, the episodic question and concern, just because we're working on a working draft. Elena, I'd be comfortable if you wanted to add the word continuous there, um, to, just so it reads how we're describing it now. Okay, um, I'm going to go back to uh, Alexis Ritvo. You are self muted. There you go. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Hi, my name is Dr. Alexis Ritvo. I am an addiction psychiatrist, the fellowship director at the University of Colorado for our Addiction Psychiatry Fellowship, and co chair of the Benzo Action Work Group with. Uh, the Colorado Consortium for Prescription Drug Abuse, um, where Rob Ballack's the um, director. So um, just wanted to add, I mean, I'm in full support of the continuous days because I think that really gets at, as Rob, Rob already mentioned, um, what was really important about this piece of legislation is really trying to limit the number of people that end up started on a benzodiazepine and take it for more than two to four weeks continuously and end up um, starting having physical dependence and decreased efficacy um, and then uh, you know a portion of those people at least 10 to 15 percent or more will end up having a pretty difficult protracted withdrawal and getting off um, we just wanted to emphasize you know that any way the consortium and specifically our work group can be a assistance um, in helping with the rulemaking as well as the provider education around the safe use of benzodiazepines and that includes um, how to safely taper individuals and make sure there's not a rapid taper or abrupt discontinuation which we're glad to see that was uh, included in the rulemaking um, and to make sure that we're getting medical provided providers updated education because the uh, the kind of general education that's out there is pretty limited um, and not uh, does not reflect what we now know about the potential long-term harms of benzos, um, which for many will out, uh, the risks will outweigh the benefits. Um, so I think that's mostly what we have to say is just support of continuous stays and that um, we just need to continue to get the information out there. And I think while we can learn a lot from um, how we, uh, impose some of the guidelines around opioids, we have to remind, remember that they're still very different medications and therefore the, the um, rules around them will look different. Alexis, this is Dimitri. Thank you for your comments. Um, I did wanna ask you really quick, 
you were one of the few stakeholders so far that has provided feedback on that third part of this proposed rule uh, that starts with nothing in this rule shall be construed. And I think you spoke to the tapering piece and the importance of that. Without any intent to want to make it more complicated, I'm just curious what's been provided or drafted thus far. It sounds like it does suffice the needs you mentioned. Is that correct? Yeah, I think so. Um, you know, because most likely if someone's involved in a taper, you know, one thing we made, we wanted to make sure was that the law did not say you had to get the benzodiazepines from the same prescriber in the last 12 months since, as I've just dealt with yesterday, patients move um, that are in the midst of these very long tapers. Um, so I think as long as it, you know, there's evidence they've gotten them in the last 12 months. Um, and I think just that it helps reiterate and try to keep from happening what we saw happen with opioids, that as you put restrictions on them, all of a sudden patients are being um, taken off them too quickly, which is uh, very dangerous, but also um, just causes a lot of distress and dysfunction. So I think, um, I mean, I, I will certainly ask, I welcome if Rob has any thoughts or any of the other physicians and um, my colleague, Steve Wright, who's even more of an expert in the literature, um, we'll make sure he doesn't have any other thoughts on what else it could say, but I think it at least really gets to the point that we don't want people abruptly stopped. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ritvo. I'm going to place you back on mute. If you would like to speak again, please feel free to raise your hand. Um, we did receive another written comment from Erica Pike with the Colorado Academy of Family Physicians. Thank you for sharing this draft rule. Will there be additional rulemaking and stakeholder meetings on other components of this bill, including the PDMP query and competency training? Dimitri, I don't know if you want to weigh in on that at all. Yeah, sorry, I was just rereading the question too. Um, so the other component of this bill um, requires, it doesn't require rulemaking as much as it requires an update to um, the, the PDMP and how it integrates with EHRs and organizations. That's something that's currently being worked on um, behind the scenes within the program and the division. Um, so with more news to come on that, but since it doesn't require any specific rulemaking, um, there, there aren't any of those forms upcoming uh, for that specific section of the bill. Thank you. Um, Dr. Lega, I show your hand raised again. Um, I have unmuted you. You're self-muted. Actually, you're not I unmuted. There we go. Oh. Thank you, Kyle Leggett, family physician. Uh, just responding to the last uh, section of the proposed rule, I completely agree with the intention. I, I appreciate the um, expertise of our addiction medicine um, colleague who just spoke. I guess my one question is, in the context of the first sentence of the rule, I would find it impossible to discontinue abruptly limit or forcibly taper a patient who hasn't had a benzo within the last 12 months. So it, sound, it feels to me more like the last section is there more for kind of intent and to reinforce the need to not do that with other patients. But that this rule specifically is for patients who have not had a benzodiazepine prescription within the last 12 months and it's not from the same provider, it's from any provider. So really the last paragraph seems like it would not apply to the patients within the first sentence of the rule. So I want to bring up, I'm going to, Elena, you don't have to change screens. I want to bring up that part of the bill and provide some rationale as to why that's there. So as you may recall in national statute, um, there is a section or sentence at the very end of part six 
that reads, the rules must allow for the appropriate tapering off of benzodiazepines and must not require or encourage abrupt discontinuation or withdrawal of benzodiazepines. Because that's in there and part of the uh, bill language, that's why part of that rule also included that. Um, hope that helps. I think there's maybe some other pieces to intent, but I want to make sure everybody has an opportunity to speak to, so I don't want to inject too much. I will say, just in case anybody wants to comment too on this, there was one comment that came out of, I think, the dental board, but I'm not 100% sure it was either the dental board or board, board, board of nursing. And it was kind of a passive comment, but um, somebody had asked, how would somebody know uh, if somebody's benzodiazepine naive or not when applying this rule? I, I think I think intuitively a lot of individuals on this call and myself would imagine what the answer to that is. And again, we, sh we should always carry rulemaking to the simplest minimum necessary to provide guidance or parameters um, in rule to further define or clarify statute. So I don't want to necessarily invite more language into the rule if it isn't necessary, but if anybody had any comments to that or more concern to build off of, feel free to, to comment. But um, there was some discussion that was had regarding uh, checking the PDMP and the like. So. Um, Dr. Ritbo, your hand is raised. You should be yeah, good to go. Yeah, I, I guess a question I have, I'm assuming that dentists can also check the PDMP as if they're able to prescribe the controlled substances. So I don't know. I mean, I know that PDMP check was not put in by law. I guess it is to me kind of implied um, that you would be checking in order to verify um, that at least within the state and the cooperating states you don't see. Um, and if a patient had been on it within the last 12 months and you weren't finding it, that they would tell you where they, what pharmacy they filled out and you would be able to confirm it. So Alexis, this is Dimitri, you're correct. Um, in our state, uh, so long as you're either a pharmacist or a prescriber, with a DA registration, you're required to uh, create and maintain an account with the PDMP, and that does include dentists as well. Okay, so it would seem if just with this law being in effect or this rule, that it would then be uh, on the, it would be the responsibility of the prescriber to verify and that they have a means to verify. Yeah, often things like that within practice, if that's the ex expectation, falls within a standard of care um, requirement, either outlined in statute or rule. Thank you, Dr. Ritvo. I'm going to place you back on mute. Looks like, this is Elena. Looks like we have a hand raised by Mr. Robert Valak. I'm gonna unmute your line. Thanks, um, this is Rob Valak again, Colorado Consortium for Prescription Drug Abuse Prevention. And um, yeah, to that issue of um, the PDMP checking and how, how one would verify, I think at least the intent was exactly what you're describing. Um, both Alexis and Dimitri, that there is a means there. Obviously, there's a means because the PDMP is there. And that's the way you would find the easiest way, probably, you would find out from the single source of truth to go to PDMP and do that. And then I think with the legislative intent was not just that you could do it, but with another piece of the bill, you must do it uh, for these similar situation. Again, the acute prescribing, um, 
not opioid, excuse me, Freudian slip, you know me, opioid guy. Um, but the um, intent is benzo naive, at least for 12 months, acute condition, okay, I'm supposed to check the PDMP, which mirrors this situation. It was meant to be mirroring that this situation, then, okay, I'm supposed to check the PDMP by law. That will tell me if there's something there in the last, last 12 months or not. And that's the default. So these kind of things are, you know, we're meant to be hand in hand, even if this, this specific rule is different from the other rule about checking the PDMP. I think they're meant to go as companion pieces, at least the legislative intent was, and that would, that would be methods for trying to solve a couple of problems that are seen out there. One of them is that, you know, more than 30 days continuous for acute conditions where there's a lot of, you know, labeling and evidence that that's not great, that problem, plus just the awareness of opioids and benzos or one either alone or in combination either being prescribed or that you might be treading into that if you find someone who's on an opioid and now you're going to prescribe a benzo, that may change your thinking. It might not, depending on the patient's risk and what's going on and the clinical calculus, it might not change it at all, but at least you'd have the opportunity now to factor in, okay, this person's going to be a concomitantly on an opioid and a benzo, even if it's for one dose or one day or one month, but you've got that awareness now and the, the, the legislative intent was, you know, for lack of better words, not to sound too draconian, but to sort of mandate that awareness was that you must check the PDMP for the benzo naive person. Um, so you have to check that and then you'll, you'll get this awareness. And those are the problems that are trying to be solved for is that concomitant opioid benzo stuff that is very common in overdose and in, in you know, and in, whether it's even in one dose, people having problems that um, can, you know, even with one dose of each of those. So to give you the awareness of it. So I think that was the intent um, between those that they'd sort of be companions. Just want to give that for, for background. Thanks. Thank you. All right, we've got another hand raised by Mr. Kevin Snyder. I'm going to unmute your line. Hello, uh, Dr. Snyder here again, Chief of Recovery, Psychiatry and Addiction Medicine. Um, I'm just uh, hoping to get some clarification on that first line um, as well. Uh, when I read it, I interpret it to mean that after uh, 30 continuous days, um, there is an opportunity to prescribe another 30 continuous days. Um, am I misinterpreting that? Yeah, like, like for instance, like in um, in stimulants, where you know you're not supposed to um, prescribe more than 90 days, or um, common practice is to do 30 day scripts. Um, would this be something where a prescriber could prescribe up to uh, 12 months? Of, of benzodiazepines if that prescriber is seeing that patient every 30 days. Not that I'm advocating for it, by the way, just so people know. <laughs> just wanted to clarify. Yeah. And, and do you um, have any like suggested language that you would like to see potentially put in this rule um, to at least address that issue or just to clarify in rule? Yeah, I, I guess I guess for me, I'm, I'm just more curious, uh, you know, about um, you know, what's meant behind the statement, you know, whether it's really truly meant to um, keep prescribers from prescribing more than 30 days per year, um, or just be more aware of the prescribing practices so that the 
reevaluating every 30 days um, the decision to prescribe again. And as a as a addiction medicine provider, uh, as well as a psychiatrist, but primarily looking at the addiction side, um, you know, I definitely have concerns about um, continue prescribing after 30 days. Uh, what everybody has said, I agree about concerns at when it continues. Um, but I, I feel like um, I don't fully understand that the intent of that um, statement when I read it, um, and I'm just wondering if anybody, you know, uh, could help me understand that better. Gotcha. All right. I don't know if anybody is on the webinar that may have um, um, some ideals as to what that would um, maybe some answers to this, but it would be good for discussion. Sometimes we have um, stakeholders that have been to the General Assembly and, and, and know more about legislative intent. So that, that would be helpful. Oh, it looks like we have several hands raised. Perfect. All right, um, Mr. Rivito, sorry. I'm gonna unmute your line. It looks like you're self-muted. Okay. Yeah. Hey, it, it's Dr. Alexis Ripple. Rob Sorry. Malik probably can say more about this, but my understanding is while we would love for there to be more restrictions on uh, and have people being reevaluated at least every 30 days for continuing, I think it felt like this, we had to start smaller um, and that it was at least an initial win just to get them to say that they would limit the first uh, 30 days so that hopefully they're having, you know, to help and then provide more education, but to patients that, you know, they will become physically dependent and what happens after you continue beyond two to four weeks. Um, so I think it's more, uh, it was not thought that, it, that that would probably be too big of an ask and there would not be as much um, support or agreement to put that further limitation, but Rob can probably say if I'm on track. All right, thank you. Just going through the list. Uh, looks like we have a couple more hands raised. Ms. Amy Goodman. Yes, thank you. I read this to mean just to make sure we're all on the same page i i read that first sentence to mean that this limit only applies to benzo naive patients so there is no limit on a prescription for a patient who has had a prescription already for a benzo within the last 12 months is that where everyone else stands on how they interpret this Thank you for that. Um, we have an additional hand raised by Ms. Jennifer Goodrum. I'm going to unmute your line. All right. Hi, this is. Uh... Good morning, Jennifer Goodrum uh, with Michael Best Strategies. We represent a number of uh, prescriber groups. And it struck me in looking at this, I think what might be helpful to some of the previous comments would actually to be putting language in here that said something about the initial supply of benzodiazepines prescribed. I think that language, and I'm trying to pull it up, I've not been able to pull the rule language um, around opioids, but I think it's pretty clear that the 30-day limit for opioids applies to that initial script. And then beyond that, there is language in the rule on the opioid side, I believe, that talks about subsequent scripts. But I think we've had a couple people ask about, you know, um, I think that might actually get a little clarity if we put, you know, a limit of the initial supply of benzodiazepine prescribed is 30 days kind of thing. Um, I was thinking, I think that language already exists in the opioid uh, prescribing standards, and we might be able to model that. 
for additional clarity. Thank you, Ms. Goodrum. Um, so yeah, we can always go back and kind of look to see if, what some of the opioid rules say. Um, I didn't put it in the comment, but all of the boards are going to be able to hear this webinar recording. And so it'll be something that will be furthered in, in their discussions and for each board to potentially look at and kind of compare the two rules. All right, I don't see any more hands raised at the moment. It looks like we might have a written comment. This is from um, oh, a couple of comments, sorry. Mr. Um, oh. Uh, yeah, it's Rob Valak again. I was just going to echo what was said earlier about the intent, which I think it's correct that what Dr. Ritbo said was, you know, the, the legislature considering additional steps, but did view this as a first step for at least looking at that first prescription for an, an acute, naive, you know, acute benzodiazepine patient um, for an acute condition, naive patient first fill, and that's what the legislature was trying to do. I really think from listening to all the a, a excruciatingly long process over several years to get to here. Um, and I think that's what they were trying to do. And then mirror the general general approach with opioids, which is the same for acute conditions, naive patients, first fill, that that's the goal is to limit that somehow to the most appropriate way. And for opioids, there was more data on seven days being maybe an appropriate initial quantity uh, day supply limit for acute pain, where here, maybe 30 days is a more appropriate continuous use of, of 30 days is a more appropriate target for acute benefits might be prescribed. So in general, the approach is trying to be pure so that yeah that docs don't so wildly different like I don't even know what you're trying to accomplish, but the same idea is um, drug naive patient, acute condition, first fill. And there's that, this is what the limit is for that one. Then you reassess and can do whatever you want on the reassessment. Maybe you have to continue. Maybe this was not an acute condition after all. Uh, maybe it was, it was, um, it revealed itself to be a chronic condition or something else, but that's totally clinician driven. Um, no, no intent to address that, just to try to work on that, you know, benzo. For what is arguably a, 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 an acute condition, um, and don't start them off that way, and at least reevaluate once. And that was the, you know, kind of how that evolved. But all of that that was said was true. All right. Thank you. So that was the written comment that we did receive. Um, you went ahead and verbalized it for us. All right. I, I don't see any other hands raised um, or any other written comments. Currently, we'll wait a few more minutes just in case somebody is typing, just to make sure we capture all comments. But once again, so this is the stakeholder, the joint stakeholder meeting. Um, it'll be well, it is being recorded. Each board is going to be able to review the comments and any written comments that you may send in. I know Darcy had mentioned it earlier, but I just want to reiterate that uh, rulemaking inbox it was sent uh, was also indicated on the notice that was sent out today. That's um, you can send all written comments to Dora 
underscore DPO underscore rulemaking at state.co.us. And so all recommendations today and written comments will be forwarded. The time is up. Right yes. All right, that's Dimitri. Um, before we part, can we make one small change and if there's significant opposition, we will we'll hear it. In that first line where it says not exceed 30 continuous days, can we strike the word for? I think it reads a little cleaner without that. So, so then it would read. I'm sorry. Um, a limit. So a limit of supply of benzodiazepine prescribed shall not exceed 30 continuous days that a prescriber may prescribe to a patient. So striking the word for, yeah, I don't think that's necessary. Oh. Thank you. If anybody feels differently, let us know. Okay, it looks like we do have a written comment that we just received. Um, Dr. Robert Val Valak, he agrees with Dimitri's suggestion to strike the word for. Um, Karen Zink, thank you for that, for providing this opportunity. Absolutely, and we, we appreciate all the feedback. Um, this is extremely helpful. when trying to draft rules and and implement new legislation. So we, we absolutely appreciate all the feedback that we've received thus far and welcome any more feedback. All right, it's been a few minutes. Um, so I guess we can go ahead and start wrapping up the meeting since we don't have any other comments or hands raised. So thank you for participating in today's meeting. The stakeholder comments and program recommendations will be presented to each board before the permanent rulemaking hearings. The tentatively scheduled hearing date for each board are as follows. For the State Board of Nursing, you will see these rules again um, for consideration in front of the board on October 27, 2021. The Colorado Dental Board on October 2nd, 2021. Elena, so I think yeah. that one's actually November 4th, 2021. My apologies, November You're 4th, good. thank you. Thank you. Um, for the Colorado Medical Board, it was on November 18th, 2021. The State Board of Optometry, the hearing will be on November 18th. 2021, the Colorado Podiatry Board, the hearing will be held on September 10th, 2021. And for the State Board of Veterinary, Veterinarian Medicine, the hearing will be held on October 14th, 2021. So unless you guys have anything else that you wanna add, I don't know if you if you had something that you wanna add, Darcy or Dimitri, um, that would conclude our meeting. Nothing else for me. I just wanted to thank um, stakeholders for your participation in today's meeting. Um, as Dimitri mentioned at the beginning, we are in the process of getting feedback from all of the boards in advance of the rulemaking hearing. So um, you will hear board discussion um, at the next upcoming meetings for all of the boards that have not seen this draft rule yet. So um, if you are planning on attending any of those meetings, you will hear further discussion from the board. Um, and as Elena mentioned, we do have the tentative date set for the permanent rulemaking hearing for um, each of the boards that are impacted by this legislation. And one other thing I think many stakeholders are aware, but in case you're not, um, all of the information about any rulemaking activities 
all of that is always um, published on the board's, each respective board's website under public notices. It's also included on the public calendar and it's sent out via blast email to all stakeholders and licensees for each board. Um, so if you think you should be receiving something and you're not, please feel free to reach out to us via that rulemaking inbox. We can make sure that you're on our list. Um, but in the meantime, you're always welcome to check the board websites um, because those are the those those are updated routinely with um, new information. All right. It looks like while you were talking, um, we did receive another written comment from Alexis Rivito or Ritlo. If there is any possibility to add language about advising patients of risks of benzos when taking continuously for two to four weeks, that would help communicate the intent should say risks of taking continuously for two to four weeks. Thank you. All right. Um, I believe that's it. Thank you again for your participation and we are going to end the webinar.